Hello, this is Jeff Tischer again. Uh, I'm going to talk today about computer languages, as that will kind of lead into some other ideas I want to talk about later. Note that this is not going to cover object-oriented programming languages, because that's a very large area of discussion on its own, but please leave comments if you want me to go into that, and I'll do another talk specifically dedicated to that uh, topic, because it is quite large. So, we're going to go through a few things here. First of all, why do they exist? Why can't we just program in English? Um, what are the terms high level and low, le low level? What do those mean? Because uh, developers will use those a lot. Um, and then we're going to talk about some specific kinds of programming languages, such as imperative languages, functional languages, and a related, uh, something kind of related to functional, which is logic languages. So first of all, why not English? Well, the CPU can't actually understand a language. It's really just kind of a set of on-off switches. So you have to actually Kind of, it has to interpret things that are that very basic binary language uh, made for that CPU. So um, that's, the, that's the obvious answer where we start. But why can't we have a programming language that is just English that we just then turn into that language for the CPU? Well, there's a few reasons. First of all, there's a huge vocabulary. Natural, like human languages like English are really, really big. And they have lots of different meanings uh, in different contexts. And most of that doesn't matter to a CPU. There's also a lot of things like weird special cases in grammar. There's lots of different ways to say things that are kind of similar, but not totally the same. Um, this would just make the tool incredibly complicated, and it would also have this interesting problem of being kind of ambiguous, because there's a lot of nuances and strange references that people use in English when expressing themselves. All right, look at the, the Watson supercomputer that was on Jeopardy. That was basically built on solving this particular problem, a huge monumental effort to solve this one issue of just nuances and references, trying to understand what, what questions and answers go together based on little tricks of the language associated with how they're phrased. You would not want that in a programming language. It would be incredibly ambiguous. Just look at any normal conversation. It can mean multiple things to multiple people at the same time, even though it's the same words. You don't want that ambiguity when you're talking to a computer. So this classic, the classic example of overcomplicated or language which would need an immense amount of understanding of the vocabulary in order to talk about it at all is Darmok and Jalad at Tanagra. So going on to high level and low level languages and what do these things mean? Well, really, the, the simple way to think of it is the human is at the top, the machine is at the bottom. And what you're doing is you're trying to kind of rationalize those two things. So it means that high-level languages are going to be ones which are more like, they kind of favor the understanding of the human, they're closer to where the problem is, how you're actually stating the problem, whereas low-level languages are going to be at the bottom. They're going to be closer to the machine and how it likes looking at things and how it actually solves the problem. So that's the big difference. See, high level closer to the problem, easier for a human, and the low-level ones are closer to the solution because they're how you actually implement the solution to the problem, uh, and it's actually what the machine uses, or it's closer to what the machine uses. And really, it's just a an issue of detail of control. How much control do you want over what you're doing? If you're using a very high-level language, it'll do a lot for you, but you lose a certain amount of control. Normally, this is a good thing because you didn't need to do that yourself, but sometimes you have to, you have to dig down a little more in certain environments usually because you're trying to do something that your high-level language doesn't understand. It's a different way of thinking about the problem or using different pieces of the hardware that it doesn't normally expose. But it's very rare that you need to actually do that. And one of the things this comes down to is uh, a phrase that I use sometimes, which is the threshold of magic. There's that idea that you're at the top, you're the human, and as you look down, depending on your expertise, you're going to understand certain things a certain number of levels down. You know, it'll be the programming language, the you know, how memory works, how the CPU works, how the transistor works, how the quantum effects between electrons work, things like that. At some point, you're going to fall off and have to think, okay, I don't know how that thing below me works. It just has to be magic. So there's this sort of threshold of magic about that tells you how far down or up this kind of level hierarchy you can go where you're actually comfortable. And that changes over time with experience. Um, in terms of imperative languages, this is sort of the, the most obvious class. Imperative, it's just a sequence of commands. So the machine in this case is represent, like the program itself is operating within a machine that has a state which can be changed. So you'll do things like writing to memory, drawing to the screen, or something like that. And that's changing, uh, that's changing the state of the machine. So it's based on being able to do that. So the commands themselves are describing how to implement the algorithm. They're the how of the algorithm. 
And this is also very similar to how the CPU works. The CPU is a state machine which takes one command, one instruction after another and executes them, which transition the state of the machine. So this is part of why it's very obvious. Also, it just makes sense from a human point of view, when you're trying to think of how to do something, you know that you, know, you get the instruction manual when you're trying to assemble something, for example, which tells you the, the list of instructions, the list of commands you need to follow to implement the thing they're describing. So it's kind of like that. That's why it's very common. So you see this in pretty much everything. There's C, C++, Java, JavaScript, even assembly is a, an imperative language. So an example of that is this little C function, which is going to have the side effect of changing this table. And all it is is, yeah, you pass in this table and a size, and it's going to walk over the table and increment every number within it by one. And that means the side effect of this function will be the table's contents have changed. So this is how C programs would work. Functional languages is sort of another class, and this is very different. It's, it's, it's not so much based on how the computer works, but it's more how the math underlying the computer science behind it works. So it's, it's a very different way of thinking about it, but it's actually very useful, and it comes up a lot, especially in uh, educational contexts or something like that. So the way to look at it as is it's, it's what's called part of the declarative paradigm. There's a few different ways of doing that. Uh, and those are based around, more around saying the what of what you're trying to solve. Like, what is it you're trying to do? What are you trying to ask? Instead of how you're trying to implement it, it's just what you're trying to do. So it approaches the problem from a different angle. And this actually, like I was saying, reads more like math. The specific kind of math you're talking about here is uh, called lambda calculus. If you go into this uh, in sort of a, a university level, you'll eventually get into this area of study where you talk about the lambda calculus and how that proves what you can do in a programming language and, and things like that. It's complicated but interesting, but it's also very specialized, so I'm not ever going to get into it here. Um, and it's also based on one of these ideas that the machine state doesn't change. There's no side effects. All you're doing is you're given some information, you have a function that's given some information, it does something with that and then returns the result back to, to whoever called it. This means that if you're given the same inputs, you'll always provide the same outputs. There's no, uh, there's no external state that you're changing or that can change you. So this is a very useful property in a lot of kinds of programming, but it's, a, it's kind of the basis of the functional paradigm. And this means it's very different from how the CPU actually works. So you have to actually have some interpreter or some compiler that changes your functional language into something the CPU can actually run. Uh, common examples of this are things like Scheme, Lisp, and Haskell. Um, I know that in, in my own background from the University of Waterloo, they talk a lot about Scheme, so you end up using a lot of that starting in about second year. So here's an example of kind of what that code would look like. You have this uh, this simple example which is just going to add an element uh, to a list but it does so in a way that, that kind of builds a list so the idea is that there's no side effects all we're saying and this is just more provided for anyone who's interested in seeing the meat of it but it's not going to be obvious how it works uh, this basically just tries to build you a list from zero to the number you give it and because Normally, you just do this by, like, oh, well, I'll just build some loop that assembles this thing. It's like, well, you can't really do that in functional. Loops aren't how it works, because loops, they, they have a state. They're, they're an imperative sequence of operations. So what you do is you have what's called a recursive function, which I've talked about in some previous talks a long time ago. Um, that's how you'd end up implementing something like loop in Scheme. And for those of you who are looking at this, this function should also be tail recursive. So that's more just a, a nod to anyone who's a functional programmer would know what that means. So the other kind of uh, programming language paradigm I'm going to just touch on today, because it's not very common, but it is kind of a, another example of how you can think about the problem, and that's logic. Now, logic is similar to functional in that they're both declarative kind of approaches. They're both part of the declarative paradigm. They're based around stating um, what you're doing, not how you're doing it. But this one's a little bit different. It's more about stating what you know and then requesting and then, then how those pieces of information are connected. And then you can issue queries to that information to find out uh, how things are related or to solve problems, things like that. Um, so it's, it's interesting but very, very specialized. Not very many software developers will ever write logic programs. Uh, so it's based on the idea that you have a sort of an environment which has 
facts in it, and then you have rules which connect facts or other rules. And then you can issue queries based on this. So uh, one way of thinking about it, although this is really not quite the same thing, but it's a way of thinking about how you can make a declarative request for some information, this is kind of like how SQL works eventually. It kind of gets down to this idea that you're asking for some information, you're performing a query on a large piece of data. Um, so SQL is that property as well, but it's, it's quite different from what goes on within actual logic programs. So the example that's really common um, that I know I've used in the past as well, but again, just in an educational context, is Prolog. So this is a very contrived example of what that means. And again, it's going to be, it's not entirely obvious at first what it's doing. So at first, I'm just going to establish some facts. I'm going to say, okay, there's is cat, which will be Ash, my cat, there's is hamster obliteron, which is a future M reference. And within that, we're going to establish some rules and say that, okay, well, anything is an animal if it's either a cat or a hamster. And then I can issue queries to that and say like, okay, well, is Ash a cat? And it'll say yes. And I'll say, okay, well, is obliteron a cat? And it'll say no, because that's not one of the facts. But then I can make more complex queries and say things like, okay, tell me about all the things which are animals. And then it, knowing the rules and the facts, it can tell me, well, both Ash, are, both Ash and obliteron are animals because one's a cat, one's a hamster. The animal is either one of those. So this is kind of how you, you build different pieces of information and different rules connecting ideas in Prolog. So again, that was sort of a, a basic starter on some computer programming languages and the ways to look at this. Um, and I can go into more detail about any of these in comments, or um, one thing I can do is if there is an interest in object-oriented programming, because it's conspicuously absent here, um, I can do another talk on that specifically because it on its own is a very large area of study uh, and there's lots to say about it and it's actually probably easier to understand because it deals with some, some higher level concepts, uh, ways of connecting information and functionality. So anyway, I hope that was helpful. Uh, get in touch if you have any questions or suggestions. Thanks.